This is what a more uh, toasted grain would look like. So this is what we call, uh, I think this is Munich malt. And so it just actually, just what you would think, it acts a little bit more of like a toasted bread quality. And you can smell it and kind of get an idea what's going on there. And then we get started to the roasted grain, which is more uh, in this world. And then it goes all the way down to where it looks like straight coffee beans. Um, and so this is just three of what you know we may use. But when we talk to our suppliers, there's full on, I mean, we have hundreds of malt varieties to pick from. And when we're picking them, we're picking from where they're coming from agriculturally, because that makes a difference on how they taste. Where they're malted is going to taste different, because you think an English maltster is going to be producing malt that he's or she's comfortable or used to tasting in an English style beer. So once you start getting an idea of where they're making these raw ingredients, then it makes sense that they're producing them to be a little bit different and more what they're accustomed to. So German malts are traditionally used for those German beers and they have certain flavors to them. English malts, American malts, et cetera, et cetera. And now there's like Patagonia's uh, down in Chile, they're making malts. So they're coming from all over and there's a big resurgence of people using local malting companies. So there's Victory in New England, there's Riverbend Malsters in North Carolina. We use raw wheat from Spring Farms, which I know like you guys use that on your mini from time to time as well. Uh, we like putting that in beers. Um, and so there's a lot of connection to place. I think a lot more people think it's just like, can think of malt as like a very raw commodity that doesn't matter, and it really, really does. So these are hops. Uh, these are some hops that we would be using in Tropicalia. We have it wrapped in tape because UV rays actually will interact with hop oils to create skunky beer in about two minutes if you leave your beer on the sun. So that's why clear bottles and green bottles are terrible for beer, and why a lot of those like Heineken taste skunky. Back in the 80s or 90s, I think it was, they actually tried to put it in brown bottles, and then it wasn't skunky anymore, and everybody complained. <laughs> um, and so they're like, okay, we they actually intentionally skunk their beer to taste skunky, which we avoid. Uh, but that's like their profile now. Uh, but you can see this. Yeah, it'll happen very quickly. I know some breweries that will, I mean, they'll like wrap, if there's this much of a gap in like a piece of glass where you can see beer for a second, they'll wrap it in aluminum foil. People get a little crazy about it, but yeah. So, um, we've got malt, we've got hops. So, hops are very similar. You gotta think very agriculturally here. Um, think about strawberries. They're grown in North Carolina versus California. They taste completely different. They have different ways that they grow due to their climate, diseases they're exposed to, and the farmers that are farming and what their preferences are. We have the same exact stuff going on with our raw materials. And hops is no exception. So hops in New Zealand, for example, don't have to worry about all of the farming troubles that you have to worry about in North America. They don't have the powdery mildew, which is a hop disease and things like that down there. So they can breed their hops for different properties and focus on different flavors. So New Zealand hops taste a certain way, Australian hops taste a certain way. You can have the same hop grown in England and in America, genetically exactly the same. When they come to us or they're in a catalog, they have different names because they taste so different. So hops are very much the same way where we pick where we want to get them from. So here we get them from Czech Republic, Slovenia, England, uh, US, New Zealand, Australia, um, you can tell, all over the place. Um, we just brewed uh, O Fantasticness, got hops from South Africa in it. Uh, those are very hard to get, so that's pretty cool. But think about that, and I think that gets, it just gets glanced over a lot, is the agricultural side of beer, and why a beer may taste different year to year, or things like that, because we're using an agricultural product that tastes different from year to year. Uh, for a long time, beer became this thing that's reduced down to the lowest common denominator, and it has no identity or ties to agriculture. It should taste exactly the same every time. Um, I think we, we try to make our beers taste very similar from time every day, uh, but really we focus on, I think, is consistent quality across the board. Tropicalia, batch to batch, we notice differences in it. I would argue that most people probably don't notice differences in it. But we say, is this up to our quality standards or not? And say, is this what we think a Tropicalia should be? Uh, would we recognize this Tropicalia? Yeah, we're cool with that, or no, we're not. And then we actually make adjustments in-house. If we're not cool with it, we never send it out the door. So, that's kind of our side and raw materials. Very, very brief. You got yeast as well. There's hundreds of strains of yeast. They all have different fermentation characteristics how much sugar they like to eat, or what temperature they like to do that, what flavors they're gonna produce. So yeast eats sugar, produces alcohol, and like 400 different flavor compounds. Those flavor compounds can vary wildly. And that's why a lager can be so clean and crisp, and then an ale can be so fruity. 
because those different yeast strains, and that's what largely dignifies the difference between an ale and a lager, is the yeast. They produce those different flavors, and that is going to make something completely different than at the end. Now, that being said, we have to try very hard to make sure that only these four ingredients get into our beer, and that's all on a sanitation level, um, where we're very, very clean, even though you know we're a bunch of dirty bearded dudes. Um, we, inside these tanks, we are certain and down to a biological level that there are no organisms in there at all that will augment the flavor or do anything to our beer. We completely sanitize the inside of these tanks when we make uh, brew beer. So we're getting it down to one single cell fungus, the one yeast that we're picking, that we're putting in millions of cells. But that is the only thing that is fermenting our beer, and that's a really big deal. Um, people talk about quality in the beer industry. A lot of new breweries are opening up. Nobody stops you from opening up a brewery and making beer. And it doesn't matter if you know how to properly clean a tank or not. You can still package your beer and send it out the door. That plays a lot onto why some beers taste good for a second, end up not tasting good very quickly, and are go weird or bad or explode in cans or bottles. And that's because other things are getting involved in that process that shouldn't be there. Um, we're also very, very, very hyper aware of oxygen. Oxygen is the enemy of beer from the beginning of fermentation through the rest of its life. All it does is make beer taste older and quicker. That's what makes anything taste old is oxidation, staling. So we get down to roughly 10 parts per billion of oxygen um, and well, before we put beer into a tank. And then we try very, very hard. Our ultimate goal all day long, canning and packaging kegs, is to do nothing but make sure least amount of oxygen gets into that as possible and that's so it stays tasting fresh for you guys so now now we've got all out of the way oh and there's water now water is a big deal for us and I think we actually focus on that a lot more than some other breweries um, I won't say that other breweries don't do it but it's just something that's very in the forefront of our conversation so what's really rad here is in Athens we have very very soft water that means there's very very low amounts of uh, minerals in them so it's, it's very very neutral water and so we actually build a water recipe for every recipe we make. Um, so our recipes include, you know, what hops we use, what malts we use, what uh, uh, yeast we use, and then also what minerals are we going to put into our water. And if you think about the wine world, how certain whites have a great minerality to them, or how you, uh, I think a lot of wines actually think about across the spectrum, uh, the minerality of that wine, whether it tastes like, you know, limestone or slate or clay, um, you kind of get that interesting perspective on where that's from and how that affects the way those flavors come across. We build that out in a lot of our beers. We put a lot of minerality into Athena because we feel like, inspired from the white wine world, that that minerality plays off into the nuances of that beer. On the other side, Bebo. The reason I also point you at Bebo is because this is the most stripped down form of beer that we make. In the sense, there's only one malt in here. There's a few hops, but very, very little. And there's one yeast, and so it, this is a, a shining um, example of our base malt, which is Canada Malting Pills. We use a Pilsner malt as the base for all of our beers. Um, from time to time, we'll switch it up depending on the beer, but generally speaking, 95 to 99% of the beer we make is all this base malt. We actually flew out to Calgary, went to the fields, checked out the barley. It's called Copeland Barley. It's the nicest barley this malster grows. Um, it doesn't fall over the fields like most barley. That means it's going to stay fresher. There's going to be less, in, uh, uh, what's the word, imperfections in the barley for us. Um, and so we really focus on really high quality ingredients because just like cooking, if you take like some terrible mass produced, you know, warehouse conditioned tomato versus getting something from a farm locally that tastes delicious, you're going to notice that difference in whatever you make in the final product. So we're very, very big about raw material supply, um, checking out where it comes from and getting to know our raw material suppliers to make sure we're getting the best stuff. So that's a little bit about of our like ethos as far as from the very get-go. And I think that kind of extrapolates into the rest of the program. As you can tell, we're very attention to detail, we're really nerdy, uh, and we're really going to bug the crap out of whoever is going to be asking us about what we do or if they give us stuff and we're really going to get down to the details of it. We brew with other breweries and they're like, you guys are like oddly scientific about everything and it, a lot of breweries come in here and it's fun because we like to do the other side as well. We're like, yeah, let's, let's do whatever, let's try it out. But we get pretty nerdy. So uh, when you talk about flavor composition then, we've got all these raw materials and we want to start building a beer. So with Bebo, it's like, well, I want it to feel good. That's a lot of things that get left off the table when you talk about making beer is you want it to taste good, you want it to smell good, but I also want it to feel good. 
Like, think about the difference between sleeping on a polyester kind of pillow that's hard or an awesome soft down pillow. And obviously you can see what I prefer, but everybody's got their own preference. But you want it to feel good. When you have that like nice warm sweater on in the summer or the winter, and you got like a quilt and like, there's something about feeling that's so comforting. And I think beer can be that, but you don't really notice it uh, unless it just hits all the right spots. So for us to be having like balance in our flavors, uh, and this is just like, um, you know, like hoppy beers, a lot of people get really, really, really intense with the hops, extreme amounts of bitterness, and I always equate that to like having a dish where you just put an insane amount of salt in it. Like people come to us like, when are you going to make a really bitter beer? And I was like, do you, do you go to restaurants and you ask them if they can just add the most salt in the world to a dish? That's a really easy thing to do. We can do that, but we choose not to because it takes a little more effort to produce something balanced, and that's what we're really all about. Because ultimately, for you guys and for us, if it's balanced, before you know it, you're going to be drinking that and it's going to be gone. So now, if you take, <laughs> if you take a look at your glass, you can check this out. So um, this is called lacing. So you can actually count the sips here. And we're <laughs> one, two, three, four, we're on a five. That's like a six sip glass. That's a pretty quick beer. And that's, <laughs> no, no, no. Look, that's not uncommon for our beers, right? And I think the reason that we're all into that is because, yeah, you guys are there too. Um, if you have a balanced beer and you take a sip, my litmus test is like, oh, I try this beer, do I want to immediately want to take another sip? And it's like, man, that's refreshing. Let's try it again. And if it is, and you do try it again, that means that we're all selling more beer, which is awesome. So we try to produce a really balanced beer that really complements things. We also try not to go super insane with that ABV, unless the style calls for it, like a barley wine or things like that. It's appropriate, and then that's a different uh, situation in which you'd be drinking beer. But for your normal beers, like our Pilsner's 4.9%, our IPA is actually at 6.5. That's a little low compared to a lot of industry standards where people get the more seven range. It's because we like to drink beer. We like to build beers that are to be drank a lot. Um, and so that's where we are there. Now, with that, back to the feeling. Um, we do a lot of things. We pay attention to the water chemistry, the way we make the beer, and the ingredients we put into it to make it really good. So try your Bebo again, and pay attention to the way it feels when you drink it. It kind of rounds out in your mouth. It's soft. It's very gentle across the palate. All the flavors come out when they need to. Nothing's really out of place. We like to make succinct beers that are soft and present very, very uh, politely, I guess is the right way to say it. And I think that's ultimately what a lot of people can't put a finger on why they like our beer or why they like drinking Tropicalia over and over and over. And that's because we're getting those hot profiles that people are used to and presenting them in a way that is just very round, fine-tuned and balanced and elegant. And those are a lot of words that I think a lot of people don't use to describe beer. And there are breweries besides us. We're not the only ones by any means. We're definitely inspired by a lot of others. But those are the words that we try to use when we talk about beer to get people to really start thinking about the little nuances of beer because that's what makes all the difference is the little details. That's what makes a good beer a good beer. Now, on the other side of that, with you guys, I think that's a really cool thing about you think about how people come in and when they want to drink something and then why we're taking this elevation to the next level. Like, why is this any better than a Budweiser? Maybe it's not, maybe it is, you know? Um, ultimately, one, a person's gonna drink whatever they wanna drink, and we can't do much about that. But we can certainly try to implore them to come to the finer side of life, right? And so, there's a time and place for Budweiser, if that's your thing, I'm not hating on anybody. But really, why are you hating on me by drinking Budweiser? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We don't sell Budweiser. Good. It doesn't mean you don't drink it. Um, anyway, um, so like I said, we're using really fine ingredients and paying a lot of attention to how we make that beer. Now, Budweiser's got all the money in the world. They can invest in really high quality uh, ingredients. They have their own farms. They can get all the, the uh, machinery they need to produce something. But ultimately, at the end of the day, their goal is about moving a lot of beer to a lot of places, getting it taste a certain way. Um, and it's a, it's a commodity product. It's, it's mass production. And we try to stay very, very involved and from tasting the grain when it goes in to all the little nuances of that, we're presenting this beer to be something that you do notice. It's not meant to be water that you consume you know, with the least amount of calories possible. No, no, you're having calories. 
That's part of this. If you don't want it, don't drink it, that's fine. But I don't know, I'm getting my own like kind of personal soapbox. <laughs> but that's kind of the way I like to think about Bebo is like this is elevated in the sense that we're using really fine ingredients. This is your farm to table steak uh, instead of your Burger King burger. Um, this is really something nice. And so when we start talking about how it goes with things, you've got this nice slate on Bebo, how it can pair with foods in a lot of different ways. You get the little fruit qualities of Bebo, you get the pepper, you get the greens, the spices, and you start realizing like this is a, like a composed salad. In my mind it is, like you get a lot of the same kind of flavors that you would get from uh, the bitterness of arugula or the acid from a lemon. It all kind of has this little place in there and the bitterness, is like it just rounds out and goes on and on. So, I feel like I've been going forever. Are we? Okay, so now. Now one last three to get to. All right. So uh, I'll start pouring this while I talk some more. But I wanted to kind of get perspective from you guys. Like, talk about the vacation side real quick. Oh uh, yeah. So um, now I get it. Like I'm going hard in the paint to the sense that this might not always make sense for your service because it takes it takes some time. It's like a two to three minute pour. But there's there's middle grounds, right? Where you can go slightly from the side and then really rock the second part. So I kind of talked about the beginning before about foam, and we like to create foam and really, I, we actually have a book on foam. Like that's, that's how big of a deal it is to us. Um, these are proteins coming from the beer, from the grain that are sitting on top. And what that offers is so much aroma. It's, it's, the, it's the first impression of a beer. Um, a lot of people, and still now, they're like, give me, you get a beer with foam on it, like, no, 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 get rid of that and top it off. I don't want any foam. And that, that little bit of foam is the first thing you smell when you put the beer up to your nose. When you put it up to greet that beer, that is the introduction. And then as you drink it, um, we do a thing called like old factory, or sorry, retronasal breathing and tasting. You guys ever talk about that with wine tasting or anything like that? Uh, but basically, as you drink, you know, you kind of inhale as you drink and you sniff. And then while it's on your palate, just kind of let it fall there and then slowly exhale through your nose and you kind of pick up a secondary wave of flavors that will come back around. And that's because you get, your, your nose is just a way more advanced tool than your tongue is. And so your nose can pick up about 60% of flavor perception that you have is from your nose. That's why as a kid, if you had really crappy uh, medicine that you didn't want, you pinched your nose. Because if you start limiting your sense of smell, then your sense of flavor and taste goes way downhill. So this is emphasizing getting that flavor and aroma into your nose. I think it just looks rad when you start getting the meringue on top too. Um, I went to a brewery up in New York to kind of change my whole ethos on pouring beer, which sounds, I know, I'm, I'm way deep in the weeds on how dirty I am. Yeah. How do you feel about like a gentle pour followed by like a hard pour? Right. That's what I think is probably more applicable to you guys because this obviously is not, when you have however many tables you have, orders, other drinks. You can't take 10 minutes to pour one person their Bebo. Um, but it's I like think 75% of like a... Yeah, I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah, absolutely, because what you're doing eventually then is that you're getting the beer in the glass, but then you're also going to get a nice foam on top. So you're still presenting it with a nice foam. We usually say about an inch to an inch and a half is what we like. Um, and so then that is there, it's still there to greet you, but it also doesn't take you all day to pour the beer. yourself a question like you got the name shaker pine what was that made for it's made as your cocktail shaker right it was never made to be drink beer out of it's like you go to somebody you break it down very simply like well, would you drink wine out of it? like no of course not I'm like okay why not because what tastes is good okay so why are we going to limit flavor uh, perception with other beverages not just wine uh, why wouldn't we want to buy a beer and that's where we arrived at this class because it's you know, you have the traditional beer shape, it's not so unfamiliar, but also it has that slight taper back to kind of bring the aroma back in. 
Um, and then we also have nucleation sites on the bottom. So if you kind of hold your glass up. Oh, I've got an old glass. If you hold your glass up, you can see, oh no, it's in there. It's kind of hard from that angle though, weird. So if you look at a weird angle, you can see like a little etched in light bulb in the bottom. And it's causing bubbles to come up. It's kind of best maybe from this angle. And it causes these bubbles continue to rise. That helps your foam stay on there as well. Like I said, beer's in the details. Are the different glasses that y'all have just basically four different styles of beer? Particularly like the ones like, what are the ones that we have that like, have like, yeah, like a little bit round? Like it's Yeah, the Nonix. Yeah, that's kind of a throwback to the traditional English pint. Um, and those, I think, um, they're not as sensory driven as these glasses are. I think they still present better than the shaker pint, but those have a nice, uh, for me it's like a warm soft spot in my heart to like old English glasses because my, my grandfather's English and I grew up with those pint glasses. So style wise, it, it doesn't really matter to you which glass, like you wouldn't use one kind of glass for a certain beer over another? Um, yeah, I would. And it's kind of the intensity of the beer. <laughs> And it's kind of with the intensity of the beer, right? So if you have a very strong, intense beer, you kind of want something where it can open up a little bit. Um, but then a very nuanced beer, like that's where I go to like, I love white wine glasses kind of for our, like our barrel aged beers. So beers that take a really long time. You have like, you did mutualism and emergence and uh, got beers like that where it's, it's all these little minutia. Then I think it's nice to present it in a stem where one, it lets the person know that you're serving it to, that this is this is an elevated situation. But two, it kind of just encapsulates all those things and you get really big whiffs of aroma. I think it's in there. I got three, I got five. Man, it's so intense. Land the plane. Yeah. So all in all, I think that's, um, I very, very quickly spoke about a lot of what's going on here. But ultimately, what matters to us the most is we pay attention to the little details we can. And like every time, when I say like oxygen matters, I mean every single time before we're putting beer into a tank, we're checking how much oxygen's in that, or we're doing something about it if it's not right. There's no... Like, real quick about the can, like the RDO rating for cans. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Um, we recently, so actively we're working on, and that's how you want me to close? Not real numbers, I'm just saying the, the philosophy behind it. Yeah, so... <laughs> No, okay. Yeah, From start to finish, basically, once it gets into the package, we've got cans and kegs. We've recently made major upgrades to our kegging, and we're talking about, like, we reprogram our kegging line, we get new hoses, like, little things where we're looking for tweaks here and there that can change it from, okay, there's 30 parts per billion of oxygen in this keg, to now we get it down to about 5 to 10. And, like, that's, that's a, a really small amount of oxygen. And that is like our ultimate quest. Is that slower, that smaller that number gets, the more our beer tastes awesome for a longer amount of time. And our cans are the very much the same way. Where we recently, uh, one of our guys just fabricated and came up with this whole part that attaches to our canning line that's not from the can line manufacturer that does a, like a CO2 blade wipe across the foam as it's being poured that then now has basically cut our oxygen numbers in half in our can. And that's something that's only come around because every day we're asking ourselves, how can we make this better? And that's just it. It's like, yeah, we've been making Tropicali for almost three years now. Actually, probably three years ago today, we brewed our first batch. It was probably Bebo, actually, it was our first batch of beer. But um, three years ago today, we brewed our first batch. And that being said, since then, we've been brewing a ton of the same beer over and over and over. But every single day, we have meetings and we're talking about, like, hey, how much did you turn this nozzle when you did this part? Uh, at, like, at 15 minutes or 16 minutes during this process, did you do this? Or how do you shake your hops into the beer? Like, we are like super ultra nerdy about every little step along the way because ultimately if we keep refining even little parts and you just chip away and make it better and better beer. Because once you get to like 90% awesome, you're doing pretty good. But those extra 10%, and that's why we keep doing it forever and like we're craftsmen that focus on what we do. But that's, yeah. I have a texture related question. Yeah. Like, so how much of that is coming from, so say we have Miller Lite and Viva, those are like our two popular builders. Yeah, yeah. 
like the, obviously the, the Miller Lite has like a lot more small bubbles and like this almost like soda water quality to it, where this has more of a like more of a full blush style. Yeah. How much is that coming from like some type of like forced carbonation or fermentation or it's, you know it's, it's like it's four it's basically four things. Uh, water chemistry, minerals play a difference in how it feels. Uh, malts, you have protein from the malt, and protein generally adds lusciousness. It's so like an oatmeal stout, a ton of protein comes from oats. Yeah. That's why those feel so big and fat. You've got um, a mount that's in there, so light, meaning that there's like very little calories left in it, which means that they really started with very little ingredients to begin with, which means there's very little left in that glass outside of water that you're drinking. And so when you strip it down that much, then there's just not a whole lot that makes an impression as substance in your mouth. Yeah. And then yeast. Uh, different yeast can produce different, like glycerol is a compound produced by yeast that um, has the perception of mouthfeel. Like Saison's, for example, they're ultra dry, um, but they still taste like substance. And that's because of the glycerol production of the yeast, and then sugar is the last thing. If you have a real sweet beer, that's why they're more like chewy and like imperial stouts traditionally have more sugar left over in them and that's why they're like more syrupy and more fat. So you're achieving carbonation just from the fermentation process? No, no, no. Carbonation comes from, we, we put carbonation into the beer. Okay. There is carbonation from fermentation and we add the rest we need um, just by hooking up carbonation to it. Outside of that though, our bottles naturally carbonate, which means we just add sugar, yeast eats it inside the bottle. It goes in still, like you know, just flat. Yeast eats the sugar and then produces gas in there, you know, more like a dosage method or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Except we don't disgorge. Right. Uh, but we're actually talking about that. That's good. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? How do you add minerals to the water? Uh, we get, so gypsum is a common one we use. That's calcium sulfate. So calcium and sulfate are two that we're concerned about. We have calcium chloride. Chloride's a big one we like to use. Uh, magnesium is what you use, so like, or salt, like sodium chloride. So then we looked at a parts per million level, each one of those individual compounds. If I add this much sodium chloride to this much, how much ppm is that of those individual minerals? And then we have targets where we want to be because each one of those kind of affects flavor and mouthfeel. Like chloride softens beer up, uh, sulfate can make kind of sharpness and, and minerality come through. And so we just get those. Like gypsum is a, it looks like powder. Calcium chloride, these little beads. So we'll get them uh, these big food safe bags, and we just kind of measure out by the gram how much we add to a batch of beer. Yeah, we treat all of our water and adjust the pH to kind of get it right in line with our target uh, acidity, our alkalinity, and then as well as the mineral content. Cool. Right. Will you do Thanks, one man. more thing? Will yes. you describe Athena? I feel like that's something that comes up a lot. As far as like most of our beers, it's like IPA, yeah. Pilsner, the way the ba best way I would say, if you don't know anything about beer, or the person you're talking to doesn't know anything about beer, is to say it's like it's an acid forward beer, um, and that I know it can sound kind of over the head of some as well, but uh, I you know start thinking about it like okay, if you have something like a lemon where it's a lot of acid, it's got that tanginess to it, or balsamic vinegar, it's got tanginess to it or anything of that nature that's got a lot of acid to it, it starts presenting that way where it's kind of tangy. So we liken it a lot to um, your white wines that have a lot of minerality to it, and then your like New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs that have that kind of gooseberry note to it. Uh, we get white grape, cider, acid, and uh, like a wheat sweetness in that beer, and that's kind of the main four flavors that we kind of associate with Athena. You break it down like that, and it takes away the whole, like, what's a Berliner Weiss? Where's that come from? Okay. It's German, but they're right across the street. You know, all that kind of weird stuff. Yeah. Cool. Does that help? Yeah, that's yeah. great. So, um, thanks so much uh, for, for uh, being here today. And, and, uh, you know, your time is valuable, so I won't take any more of it uh, than needed. But what I want to do um, in some way is uh, kind of translate a little, like some of what Blake is saying and more so kind of the overarching theme of what Blake has presented um, into like real life at the National when you show up for work and clock in. Um, and so I understand in theory what he's saying, but I can't actually do any of it. Um, <laughs> and so my, my job is more so the idea of how can we create like an experience for folks in Athens that are visiting um, that is uh, centered around our beer and the food that's provided 
um, and do so in a way that people aren't just having a beer with dinner, but they're actually having an experience that's unique, even if they've had the beer before. And so um, in the wine world, people talk about that kind of stuff all the time. Um, it's, I was talking to clients on the way over here, and this is not good information for him uh, by any means, but um, there's kind of this evolving idea of beer as being something that can actually add to your experience at a restaurant um, and you guys are positioned in such a way to have more of that appeal than other restaurants. Um, certainly you can drink Bebo with wings at a you know, shitty dog bar um, and, and enjoy it, but the people that come into the National, um, I am assuming, based on what I know about the restaurant, um, they want to have an experience and they're willing to pay for it. Um, and so the price point of our beer is super accessible. It's not going to deter any one of your customers from actually paying for it. I think, from my opinion, the biggest deterrent for your customers to actually enjoying our beer and maybe two or three of them is just a lack of knowledge and the way that it's presented. And so you uh, may even have a customer that comes in from Atlanta and he orders Tropicalia only because he can't get it in Atlanta, not because he even really likes IPAs. If you really like caught him you know, on his back porch, he would drink Budweiser or PBR all day long. And so, but he feels like he probably should like it. And um, you're gonna have customers that you know, don't really like IPAs and you know, think Budweiser is a shitty beer, but they've always enjoyed like more acidic foods and more acidic dishes. Um, and so something like Athena is something that blows people's minds that they've never been exposed to before. Um, so I could probably talk for another 45 minutes um, on kind of my kind of take and approach for how to help you guys, um, but I'll keep it to like five minutes and essentially just say that um, I would really encourage you to be really curious of something that's a value for all of us. Um, it gets us in trouble because we ask so many questions that uh, we'll get down in the weeds and our supervisors are like, what the, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you thinking about this, you know? Um, but for you guys, um, there's a couple things that can be affected. Number one, um, you're gonna get better tips, um, which is real money, um, by, by, by selling craft beer and people enjoying it. You're gonna have more loyalty. So the customers that are your regulars, when you recommend a pairing uh, for a dish that they consistently get with a beer that actually accentuates that um, that dish, they're gonna come back and ask for you, or they're gonna come in, and when they get you, they're gonna remember that you gave them a good experience and they're gonna tip more. So it actually does increase your, your bottom line. Um, I did some quick math with another account in Athens, and it was about a $1,000 a year difference. Um, so if I came to you and said, Give you a performance review we're going to give you a thousand more dollars a year um, all you have to do is just say this is bebo and here's your 20 second spill and why it fits with this um, and if you do that i'll give you a thousand dollars more a year would anybody turn that down no right so it, it's probably more than that at the national it's probably more than a thousand dollars a year that you guys can see um, so the other thing is, is that we want to give you an opportunity to experience our beer and for you guys to present our beer in such a way where they understand the nuance and they understand the flavors and the process behind it. Um, and it doesn't take any more time. You're already there anyway. You're already getting paid to be there. You're already walking up to the table serving those folks anyway. Um, it just takes a, like that next level um, of conversation and questions um, to just give them an opportunity to have something that's really unique. Um, and it's going to create more loyalty, it's more job security. Um, if people love the National and keep coming back to it, it makes you more money and it, and it means that you're going to have a job. Um, so it's, it's, it's really all to your benefit to learn more. You don't have to be an expert or a nerd. Um, I've been doing this for over a year and I have like 140 accounts in Athens. And I can tell you that in the entire year that I've been doing this, I've had people ask me what hops are in Tropicalia like three times. It just doesn't matter. Like the, the data is cool, but most people don't care. But I have had numerous people, especially bartenders and servers, talk about how they have this particular menu item that just blows away like customers when they pair it with whatever beer. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about how that might work, um, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm going to give you all my business cards. Um, that is what I'm supposed to be doing, is being here in Athens representing Future Comfort. So um, if you have any questions, concerns, if you want to come into the brewery and do a tour, um, you know, you can uh, reach out to me anytime. I'd be happy to, uh, to show you around. Um, ideally, more, more people together at one time. Um, but then also, I would encourage you to have conversations with the folks uh, in the back of the house and talk about how the dishes that they're preparing, especially like a special, um, may pair with the beer that you guys um, 
uh, are trying. So anyway, that's kind of my deal. But anything uh, in the future, feel free to reach out to me. We give you all of my cards, and um, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you so much.